Well, thank you for joining us tonight. The subject is the Bible and the Middle East. Now, with all that is going on there at present, this is a very sensitive subject. And I just want to make one or two things clear before we start. First of all, all suffering in the Middle East is heartbreaking. Whether it's Israeli, whether it's Palestinian, as Christians, we pray that there will be a return to more peaceful conditions as soon as possible. Secondly, I'm going to say a lot about Israel tonight and about God's plan for Israel. And I do believe that God has a plan for Israel. But that does not mean that everything the Israeli state does is right. The leaders of Israel are just like the leaders of their own country. They're just like you. They're just like me. They're sinful people. They're fallen men and women. They make mistakes. They do things wrong. And so it's not a blank check just to say that everything that Israel does must be right. And then thirdly, this has become a very political, a very polarised issue. I don't want tonight to give any sort of political talk. What we're going to do is look at what the Bible says about the Middle East. I'd like to read a passage from Luke chapter 21, verse 29. The Lord Jesus is talking to his disciples And listen to what he says. And he spoke up to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is near at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Assuredly, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away Till all be fulfilled, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Amen. If you had been standing in the audience listening to the Lord Jesus and had been a Jew, immediately he mentioned the fig tree, bells would be ringing, because the Jews knew that in the Bible the fig tree is used as a picture of the Jewish nation, the Israel, Israeli nation. And so when the Lord Jesus talks about the fig tree and it begins to bud and it begins to bear fruit and the Lord is talking about events that are coming and he says, when you see that happening, in other words, keep your eye on the fig tree, keep your eye on Israel. Dear friends, Israel is the is the key to the Middle East. Israel is the key to the future of the Middle East. And so this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to take a look at Israel and the Middle East. Now, we're going to approach it in this way. First of all, the central message that we want to convey tonight is that there are predictions, there are prophecies that are made in the Bible, very specific prophecies about the Middle East. We're going to think about fulfilling the Bible prophecies, events that will take place that will fulfill the prophecies that are laid out in the Bible. But before that, we're going to think about setting the stage. And we're going to look at present day events, things that are happening now, things that are filling our screens and our newspapers and our radio stations, uh, topics that are being discussed at the moment, things that are happening at this very moment. And I believe that these are not the fulfillment of Scripture, but they are setting the stage for Scripture to be fulfilled. And then thirdly, we're going to think finally of getting the message. Because it may be interesting, it may be fascinating to think of Bible prophecy and to think of how present-day events are setting the stage and preparing things for the prophecies to be fulfilled. But dear friends, we've missed the point unless we get the message. There is a message that is relevant and important for every one of us here this evening. So first of all, we're going to think about setting the stage. Let me just say again, I don't believe that present day events are the fulfillment of the predictions and prophecies in the Bible, but the stage is being set. You go to a production in Eden Court or some other theatre, and you'll find that as the curtain is drawn back, you'll find that the stage has already been set. Someone has been busy behind the scenes, setting it all out, laying it all out, ready for the drama to commence. I believe that's where we are today. 
The stage is being set, the scenery is being put out, as it were, the space is being made, and the great drama, the dreadful drama that is about to unfold, we're going to discover. But at the moment, as I say, the stage is being set. I want to think of four things that are happening at the moment that are setting the scene, that are setting the stage for the fulfillment of prophecy. The first is the rise of anti-Semitism. When Hamas attacked Israel on the 7th of October, it did not do so to get a two-state solution. That's the last thing they want. They didn't want that at all. And the reason that Iran is behind it all, and the reason that Yemen are involved, behind it and beneath it, is nothing but hatred of Israel. All that Hamas want to do is wipe Israel off the map. They've said that. I can say that quite clearly because they say it themselves. And it just reveals, I'm not here to talk about politics or to talk about different groups, but what I'm saying is this, that it has uncovered that underneath all this, at the bottom of it all, is anti-Semitism. Now, I gave a talk here about anti-Semitism some time ago. Anti-Semitism is nothing new. It didn't start with the Holocaust. What was yesterday? Holocaust Memorial Day. And it's quite ironic that just a day after, or a day before the Holocaust Memorial Day, the International Court of Justice has almost bound over, they haven't said that Israel's committed genocide, but they've bound them over not to commit genocide. They're basically suggesting that you're just about at the committing genocide. They're accusing them basically of doing what the Nazis did to them. Friends, I don't want to get into politics, but I can say this quite clearly. There has been an explosion of anti-Semitism in our country. The Times newspaper in November quoted the EU as saying, that anti-Semitism in Europe is at its worst level since the 1930s. There's never been more anti-Semitism since the 1930s in Europe. Now, as I say, that's not to give Israel a blank check and say they can do what they want, but dear friends, let's be under no illusions about this. At the bottom of it all, there is a satanic desire to wipe Israel off the map. Anti-Semitism. And it's rising. And it's spreading, and it's in the media, and it's in our colleges, it's in our schools, our universities. Children are being taught that Israel is committing apartheid and genocide and so on. Dear friends, let's be under no illusions. There is a rise of anti-Semitism, and that is setting the stage for what's going to happen. Also, there is an isolation of Israel. It's very interesting, I'm sure we all noticed that when these attacks happened, there was to begin with sympathy on all hands for the Israelis. I think it lasted about a week. And then suddenly all the sympathies turned on the other side. And even before Israel had, had lifted their finger in retaliation, there were marches on the streets of our country supporting Hamas. And what was happening is this, and, and gradually, and there's something in, on, online today in the Daily Telegraph website to say that Biden and the United States is now trying to step back from supporting Israel. What they're trying to do, they're trying to just step away from Israel because you know if it wasn't for the support of the United States, the likelihood is that Israel would, would almost cease to exist. It's only because of the support of the United States that Israel has survived so long. And the human level. And with everything so uncertain in the United States, and with everything that's going on in the world, there is an increasing isolation of Israel. They've got very few friends. Very few friends. And I would suggest to you, the group of friends is getting smaller. The third thing is the spreading conflict. You've noticed this. That here it begins. Basically, Hamas and Israel. And this almost tiny conflict, in a certain sense, is suddenly spreading over the whole region. And now Iran's involved, 
Jordan today. I think there were three American soldiers killed in an attack in Jordan. Yemen. Uh, countries around are, are getting involved either in supporting the belligerents or, or trying to, to, to help them in some way. And so what you see is that something that starts so small seemingly is now spread and it's affecting almost every country in the world. And the final one I want to speak about just briefly is global instability. There has never been a time, probably, not in our memories at least, when things have been so unstable in the world. I was listening to somebody, a historian, saying the other day that, that after the fall of communism, we were in a post-war society. And, and now the consensus of opinion is this, we are in a pre-war society. And you'll notice that recently the NATO uh, uh, chief said that we had possibly 20 years, was it? Somebody else said 10. I think our own defence minister said maybe six or seven years before we're at war. And they're talking now about whether they can call people up, whether they can conscript people. Now, now that may never happen, but what I'm saying is this, that globally things are very unstable. And let me say this, not just in a military sense, but in a financial sense. You know, we think that these great financial institutions, that they're there forever, and they're solid rocks, and we can depend on them. And we've seen in the past how they can just go like that. And America, this massive powerhouse and, uh, and financial centre, and yet, I think if we examine the foundations, they're very shaky indeed, very insubstantial. Things can change overnight. Things can change so quickly. And because of this, and because something used to happen in China, it would be 30 years before we heard about it in the West. Now it's 30 seconds. Everything's connected. You sneeze in Beijing. And somebody catches the cold in Washington. It's all over the world. And the access to the internet and 24-7 and, uh, news has meant this, that now world events affect the whole, the whole world. Every, every nation is affected. And there is great instability. Let me just say there's a social instability and there's moral instability. Don't think for a minute that the, the current gender craziness has got nothing to do with all this. It's, 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 it's a great method of creating unstable societies. And Satan is a master of it. And that's what's happening. And, and, and uh, while well, well, I'm at it, uh, um, you know, this eco hysteria. Uh, one of the effects of it is this that is going to become, we're going to become, instead of less reliant on other countries, we're going to become more reliant on them. And power is going to go into the hands of just a few blocks. And the whole world is very unstable. Now, I've, I've spoken too long on that. So let's move on. I hope you will see that what I'm saying is, this isn't the Bible being fulfilled, but things are moving towards what I think the Bible predicts is going to happen in the Middle East. And that's exactly what I want to talk about now. I want to think about fulfilling prophecy. The interesting thing about the Bible is this. The Bible has a tremendous track record of fulfilled prophecy. The Bible has prophesied things <coughs> thousands of years, and then that prophecy has come to pass exactly as it was prophesied. It's history now. Once it was in the future, once it was a prophecy, now it's history. Dear friends, let me say this. All the prophecies of the Bible will one day be history. And because God has been absolutely accurate in predicting and prophesying what would happen in the past, we give absolutely <coughs> certain that his prophecies and predictions about the future will be no less accurate. I want to focus on a seven-year span. The Bible talks about this period, and I just want, there's so much we could say about Bible prophecy and about the future, but I want to talk about this, this period because it specifically deals with the Middle East. Uh, and I want us to take a look at this. The Bible identifies a seven-year period, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, in which certain dramatic events are going to happen, and most of them are going to center in the Middle East. These seven-year periods divided into two. You'll notice I've divided it into two here. 
The first period, three and a half years, are called the beginning of sorrows. The second three and a half years is described graphically as the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, we call this seven-year period the tribulation. The second half, more accurately, is the great tribulation. Now, what I want to do tonight is just, uh, there are many things we could talk about. We could be here until next week. <laughs> but what we're going to talk about, I just want to identify seven specific things the Bible says are going to happen in the Middle East during this seven-year period. And we don't have time to deal with them in great detail, thankfully. Uh, but we're just going to mention them. And you'll see how God's program is going to develop. The first thing that's going to happen, in fact, this, this really kicks off. This starts the clock. This starts the clock ticking on the seven-year period. What is it? Israel is going to sign a security treaty. Israel is going, we've been talking about this already, surrounded by enemies, increasingly isolated. They are going to be desperate for a treaty with some country or block of countries that can guarantee their security. Now, wait a minute. What's happened to the United States? You can tell me at the door. Something's happened to the United States. The United States is no longer in the picture. And so what happens is this. Israel is surrounded by its enemies. It's isolated. Uh, there are those around about Israel who are determined to, to wipe it out. And then suddenly, riding to the rescue, there is a ten-nation confederacy. <coughs> Now, many Christians got quite excited when the, when the EU started, European Union, the EEC as it was. Uh, they got quite excited and said, this is what this is. And then, of course, the excitement was mounting because there were seven members, then eight members, then nine members, then ten members, and then eleven, then twelve. There's twenty odd at the moment. I don't think the EU, as it stands, is this ten-nation confederacy. But I'll tell you this, it shows us what it could be like. And what's going to happen is that ten nations are going to get together, bind themselves in some kind of economic and military and political union, and they're going to have one head. And that man who's the head of that uh, ten-nation confederacy is going to be known later on as the Antichrist. And he's going to ride to Israel's rescue. And he's going to say, listen, you sign, I'll guarantee you peace for the next seven years. I'll give you a guaranteed treaty, a security treaty. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Dear friends, we can see this happening at the moment. As I said, if you plucked the United States out of the picture, Israel would be desperate for somebody else to back them, to secure their peace, to protect them, to supply them with arms. And somebody's going to step into the gap and is going to be the leader of this ten-nation federation. You read about this in the book of Daniel. Can you imagine that? The book of Daniel, thousands of years ago. Daniel's writing about this. The Lord Jesus refers to it when he was here. The second thing that's going to happen is an invasion of Israel. There is what the Bible talks about. You need to turn to the prophet Ezekiel for this. But in the prophet Ezekiel, he talks about a northern confederacy. People up in the north. And he describes and he gives them names and, and he talks about who they're associated with. And Bible scholars are convinced of what he's talking about. What Ezekiel is recording is a northern confederacy of nations headed up by Russia. And what are they doing? It's described in graphic detail in the book of Ezekiel. They see their chance to invade Israel. Why are they doing that? Well, let me suggest this. When Israel is surrounded by its enemies... Its enemies will be delighted that now they can wreak their revenge on Israel. And then suddenly, someone steps in and says, I'll save you. I'll give you peace. I'll give you security. And they are furious. And at their behest, and possibly for their riches and for their oil, I don't know, for whatever reason, Russia, maybe just to further destabilize the situation, decides that Russia... And, and, and allied with Turkey, allied with Muslim states, allied with some of the North African states, are going to attack Israel. And they invade Israel, and Ezekiel tells us 
And, and it tells us this, that this invasion is going to stall on the mountains of Israel. And they're going to be defeated by a supernatural force. And the whole world is going to wonder at this. It's not suddenly that Israel has defended themselves. Something amazing is going to happen, which means that the enemies, the northern invaders that are coming down to wreak havoc in Israel, they are destroyed on the mountains of Israel. And so they are going to invade Israel, but they're not going to succeed. Now linked to that, here's the third event. This man, who is the head of the Ten Nation Confederacy, he is going to be growing in his stature and in his demands and in his claims. And at some point, the Bible describes this in Revelation chapter 13, at some point this man receives, it seems to be a personal thing, he receives a fatal wound. It's a deadly wound. And he is healed. He recovers from it. And and the Bible says, you read about it in Revelation 13, the whole world is wondering after this man. They think he's some kind of superman. And what it is, dear friends, is this. It's nothing less than a counterfeit resurrection. And Satan is getting his man in place. And he's trying to convince the people of Israel who already think this man is great because he's our protector. And it's trying to get these people to actually think this man, he must even be, he could even be our Messiah. He could be our Savior. He is a man who dies and comes back to life again. That's a claim that only Christ can make. This is a counterfeit. And so here is a man who is, he, 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 he signs a treaty with Israel. Uh, the country is invaded and defeated And it seems to Israel that that they are secure and they're safe. And this man, perhaps in the conflict, it's suggested perhaps in this battle, this conflict with the north, he is wounded in such a way that it's obvious he's going to die, or he does die, and he's revived and is hailed as a miracle. And he is hailed as a superman. And Israel thinks, perhaps, some of them at least, that they've got the Messiah. There's a lot more happening in these years, but I don't need to focus on that tonight. The fourth thing is going to happen. If Israel think that everything is fine and secure, they're going to be sadly mistaken. Because the Bible says, Daniel says this, that after three and a half years, that seven-year treaty, the, the Antichrist is going to break it. And he's going to turn against the nation of Israel. And... He is going to defile the temple. Do you know how he's going to do that? The Lord Jesus spoke about this. He's going to set something up. You see, don't be sending money at the moment to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. All you're doing is building it for the Antichrist. Because he's going to have that temple. And what he's going to do with it is this. He's going to set up, the Bible says, the abomination of desolation. What's that mean? It's an image of himself. You know, one thing, if you read the history of Israel, the nation of Israel, you'll find this, that when they went down to Babylon, before they were taking captives down to Babylon, they were idolaters. They, they, they worshipped the gods of the nations round about them. They learned their lesson. When they came back from Babylon, one God. One God. There's one thing that Israelis have been since then. Monotheists. To them, it's a horrific thing to worship an idol or to worship another god. And this man is going to break the treaty with Israel and he's going to set up in the temple an image of himself and he's going to command worship of this image. And many in Israel, the Lord Jesus talks about this, when they see this abomination of desolation, their eyes are going to be opened to realize that this man is no savior for them. He's no Messiah. He is the Antichrist. He is the one who's, who's actually going to be t- going about to, t- to annihilate them. And so, halfway through the week, the treaty is broken. We must move on, quickly. That begins what we've been calling the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years. And this is a time, you can read about it, most of the book of Revelation is taken up with this. It is, it is dealing with supernatural judgments. It's dealing with, 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 with great uh, catastrophes on the earth that are, that are brought about by God as he brings judgment on the earth. 
And it is a time of violent persecutions. You all heard about the mark of the beast. Now this man, he is getting bigger and bigger and he's demanding worldwide obedience and worldwide worship. And he's making a rule that unless you've got the mark of the beast in your hand or in your forehead, you can't buy or sell. Our great-grandparents couldn't understand this. But you can understand it. Because when you go into the shop, all you do now is just take a piece of plastic and swipe it. Just touch it. It's not a big leap to just put your hand against it, is it? That's what's going to happen. And the Antichrist is going to try and control. And there are forces at work, even at the moment, you've heard about the Great Reset and all the rest of it. There are forces at work to globalize things, to have a one world government. That's exactly what the Antichrist is wanting. That's what he's planning to do. And this is what unfolds during this dreadful time of the Great Tribulation. The Bible says this, that in these times of judgment, men will want to die and not be able to die. They'll want to die and not be able to die. So great will be the suffering and judgment poured out on this earth. Now there's an awful lot going on during the tribulation I'm not, I'm not dealing with tonight. But what I'm talking about is what is going to happen in the Middle East. The Middle East is the cauldron. That's where it's all going to happen. And that is where... The Antichrist, to begin with, he's not living even in Israel. But after the invasion from the north, he moves into Israel. He takes over Israel. He sets up his kingdom. He's got three cities. Uh, he's got three cities. He's got Rome. He's got Jerusalem. He's got Babylon. These are his three capitals. And the Bible says that he is going to rule. He's going to set himself up in the temple of God as though he were God himself. Number six, Armageddon. I, I just logged on today <clears throat> to the uh, Daily Telegraph website and here was an article. They'd sent a reporter to Megiddo to have a look at Armageddon. Because, of course, the Bible teaches this, that at the end of this period, as, as things are in dreadful, um, are, are, are in a dreadful state in, in the world and, and, and the, the Antichrist is trying to get this one world government not everyone's going to submit to him there are going to be blocks of countries that are going to rebel against him, the Bible talks about the kings of the east and the king of the south, the king of the north and people like that, there are, there are blocks of countries that are going to come against and they're all going to be drawn the Bible says to Megiddo for the final great it's not just one battle, it's a campaign of Armageddon, you've heard about Armageddon I just, uh, I was, you know, you couldn't make this up, but uh, they sell T-shirts at Megiddo. I've been to Armageddon. I've been to Armageddon. I hope none of us are ever at Armageddon, I'll tell you that. Because Armageddon is when the armies of the earth come together and Israel is going to be right in the middle. And it will seem that the state of Israel, the beast is fighting, the Kings of the East are fighting. They're all fighting together and Israel is in the middle and they're going to be pulverized. They're going to be annihilated. And it's come to the end. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what the Bible says. And Israel is going to face annihilation. But Christ returns. Just at that very moment, the Bible says, you read about it in Revelation chapter 19, the heavens are going to be opened. It's, it's, it's like somebody pulling back the screen, pulling back the curtains. And then from heaven, there's going to come thundering down to earth. Uh, one who is riding a white horse, and picture at least, followed by the armies of heaven. And he's got a name written on him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Lord Jesus is coming back in power and glory. I believe that with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. And he's coming back. The Bible says he's going to set his feet. Where's he going to stand? He's going to stand on the very spot he left. When he went back to heaven, Acts chapter 1, he stood on the Mount of Olives and he left the Mount of Olives to heaven. And the angel said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking up into heaven? This same Jesus is going to come again. And the same way you saw him go. And the Bible says, Zechariah in the Old Testament says, His feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives. And the Lord Jesus, 
And the armies that are gathered to Armageddon are going to turn. And the Bible says they're going to direct their hatred and their fury against the armies of heaven. And it's going to be a wipeout. There's going to be no real battle at all. It will be over. In fact, Paul writing to the Thessalonians, he says about the wicked one. He's talking about the Antichrist. He says he's going to be destroyed with the breath of his mouth. In other words, Christ is going to blow on him and destroy him. The, the victory that the Lord Jesus is going to... He's coming back, not as he came the first time. Don't look for the meek and lowly Jesus. He's coming back as the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. And he's going to put down all evil and all sin and all wickedness. And he's going to, he's going to land on the Mount of Olives. You know where he's going after that? He's going to the very city where he was stripped and spat on and crucified. He's going to Jerusalem. And he's going to enter Jerusalem as the conqueror. And the Bible says this about the nation of Israel. They will look on him whom they pierced. And they are going to be shocked. And they're going to realize that it's all true. That the Jesus of Nazareth we thought was an imposter. And we nailed him to the cross. And here he is in power and glory. He's come from heaven. He's the Messiah. And the Bible says they're going to mourn for him. They're going to be weeping and grief and repentance. And they're going to hide themselves away. And they're going to mourn for him as though they've lost their only son. They're going to realize they crucify their own Messiah. <coughs> And you know what the Bible says? A nation is going to be born in a day. They're going to be born again in a day. They're going to repent and receive the Lord Jesus. And he's going to come in to Jerusalem. And it's not our subject. You'll be thankful tonight. We're just about at the end. It's not our subject. He's going to set up his kingdom. And he's going to reign for a thousand years on this earth. I believe every word of it. (laughs) <laughs> but not because I say it or I understand it, the Bible says it. Dear friends, that's what God has <clears throat> predicted and prophesied about what's going to happen in the Middle East. And what we're seeing today is just the furniture being moved around and the stage being set and the preparation made. Now, we get to the end. Getting the message. You might say, well, Maybe you're a bit bored by this, or maybe you think this is a bit fanciful, or maybe you think, well, that's quite interesting, but, you know, let's have a cup of tea. Dear friends, what we're talking about tonight is not just some kind of academic, theoretical, theological discussion. It affects you. (coughs) Three ways, just as I sit down. First of all, it tells us this, that, see this book? You can trust it. Don't you worry what other people say about it. Don't you worry what the media say about it. Don't you worry if people laugh at it and mock it and, and say it's a collection of fairy tales and, and you believe in the fairy in the sky and all this. Don't you worry about that. You can trust this book implicitly. And if you're ever going to be a Christian, you'll have to trust it with your soul. You'll have to be willing to put your life on this book and what this book says. And you can do it. Because God can be trusted. The Bible can